Hey everyone, welcome to Goodbye Privacy. I'm your host, James Azar. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, James underscore Azar1. Follow the link below there. And also make sure you're going to cyberhubengage.com to subscribe to our newsletter, getting alerts, and also some great exclusive content to those who are part of our newsletter. On today's episode, we are going to talk about YouTube and the social media ban that they've recently done on different entities and what does it mean to our privacy and our freedom and a bunch of other things. Now, technically, if you're an avid listener to our podcast, this episode was supposed to be all about the real data cartels, the credit bureaus. But over the last few days, I've given this YouTube issue a serious amount of time to think about it, review it, try to understand it, wrap my head around it some way or another. And I decided that this would be the topic we're going to be talking about on today's episode. But before we start, I want to ask you guys and urge you to go to patreon.com forward slash cyber hub engage to help support our podcast. It's our loyal listeners that allow us to continue to create the content that you've come to expect from us, whether it be on this very podcast right here, Goodbye Privacy, or our CyberHub Engage podcast. We care about security and privacy, and by going to patreon.com forward slash CyberHub Engage, you get a ton of really cool perks, uh, including interacting with myself and our guests here in the studio, and we have them getting very exclusive content that's only available on Patreon, access to our mailbag, um, some really cool swag, like some of the stuff you see here, hats, mugs, and our Data Cartel t-shirts. And all that starts at only $1 a month. So make sure you go to patreon.com forward slash cyberhubengage. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash cyberhubengage to support our podcast. So over the last several days, there's been a discussion around the ban of various channels on YouTube that's leading to a censorship debate in open forum. And there's a lot of sides to this argument and a lot of misleading headlines to go along with it. And I feel like these headlines are the first warning signs in our quest to even remotely redeem any part of our privacy back. Simply because no one cares about our privacy. And there's a reason for it. We all use platforms like YouTube, which is now the number one platform in the world for streaming any sort of video. Facebook, social media, Twitter, tweeting, I mean, Instagram for pictures. So there's... A lot of different platforms out there where instead of technically getting our news the traditional way, we're getting them through these various platforms. And we're listening to various experts, pundits, or wannabe news folks on various topics. And who's to argue with that? I mean, we all love free. Who does it? right? Food, free food always tastes better than food that you pay for. And YouTube, Google, Facebook, and Twitter, they give us a free service that we all love. But the price that we pay for these free services is really hidden. It's more, they make actually more money by giving us the service for free than charging us a basic access fee to use their network platform or publishing platform. So that's why you've never heard Mark Zuckerberg or Sergey Brin Talk about charging users to access YouTube or Facebook or Twitter. They want to keep it free because when there's no money exchange and it's a free transaction, the rules are different. And that brings up the argument for our privacy and the banning of some of these companies and the different content providers that are on these channels. And because these companies like YouTube, which is owned by Alphabet, which is the mother company of Google, or Facebook, or others, because of the way they define themselves, and that, by the way, changes quite frequently. 
it changes based on the argument. They're either a publisher in one case, and that's been the case with Facebook, where their lawyers argued in a court case when they were sued by an app developer that they are a publisher. And then when Mark Zuckerberg was in Congress, he argued that they are a platform and a tech company and that they don't publish any content at all. But yet they're monitoring, regulating, and kicking people off their platform with very, very vague rules. So this move from YouTube is generating a lot of outrage along with a very slippery slope towards totalitarianism. I hope I said that right. <laughs> Big words. <laughs> it is. So for a moment, I want to set the stage for what's been going on. And I'm kind of going to do this reverse. I'm not going to go into this whole um, Carlos Mays, Stephen Crowder piece. I'm going to get to that at the very end. Uh, because while that's really what's catching headlines now, this goes much deeper and they want us to focus on, oh, well, it's only Steven Crowder and we didn't kick him up. We didn't deplatform him, him. We demonetized him, meaning he no longer can make money off of his YouTube channel and take advantage of some of the perks of having 4 million subscribers on YouTube. So again, my approach and, and what I want you to get out of this, if you're listening is let's first of all review these rules, then we'll go back and look at the maze and Crowder situation, and then we'll talk about how that impacts our privacy. So here's what YouTube said, and I will be quoting the company's blog. So here's the following thing that was posted in the blog, and I quote, YouTube is changing its community guidelines to ban videos promoting the superiority of any group as a justification for discriminations against others based on their age, gender, race, caste, religion, sexual orientation, or veteran status. In addition to those categories, I quote again, YouTube is adding caste, which has significant implications in India and well-documented violent events, such as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting and 911. Users are no longer allowed to post videos saying those events did not happen. That's from the YouTube uh, blog post that was posted explaining the changes in their community rules. So I want to address really the, the second part of this because I agree with the first part. I also agree with, with the second part of it, which is if someone is denying a real tragedy... Um, and they're posting videos and promoting that rhetoric and whether it be about 9-11 or Sandy Hook, um, then that, that definitely surely should be banned. And I'm glad that YouTube is finally taking a stand against it because that means that there's finally some sort of concept behind understanding it. Now, YouTube continues to say, and I quote, the openness of YouTube's platform has helped creativity and access to information thrive. It's our responsibility to protect that and prevent our platform from being used to incite hatred, harassment, discrimination, and violence. And here's where I have an issue. So I agree with the openness of the YouTube platform. But to protect and prevent the platform from being used for hatred, harassment, discrimination, and violence comes to the point where what constitutes discrimination, harassment, and hatred? And how general is it? So are you going to ban Antifa videos from YouTube because they promote and incite violence? Because every single headline that I've read since this story has broke has been around banning white supremacists like they're the worst. Um, a few days ago, Bill de Blasio held a press conference on and wanted to discuss anti-Semitism and the rise of anti-Semitism in New York. And he said that most anti-Semitism in New York comes from um, white supremacists and Immediately after that press conference, the FBI in New York and various other uh, state legislatures in New York came out and, and, and completely refuted the 
the, the, the claim by Bill de Blasio that white supremacists are responsible for anti-Semitic attacks in New York. Fact is, um, most anti-Semitic attacks in New York happen by uh, an immigrant minority that resides in the city. And most of it is towards um, older uh, religious Orthodox men. So they're not going after younger Orthodox men who are capable and able to defend themselves. The anti-Semitism in New York is really and clearly addressing only one kind, which is the elders, and it's performed predominantly, and I mean predominantly like in the 80s and 90s percent, and I don't have those numbers specifically on me um, to give those to you, so I'm not going to uh, go on the record and give you any sort of misinformation. Um, You're able, each and every single one of you who is listening is obviously able to go into Google and research this and find a reliable source to quote this. But if you look at the FBI numbers, the FBI numbers clearly state that I think over 80% of them were done by minorities. Um, So the anti-Semitic attacks in New York have nothing to do with white supremacy. Um, I live in the South and I don't have an issue with it either. So kind of one of those where I go, you know, when you're talking about inciting hatred, harassment, discrimination, and violence, what's that definition of it and who gets to decide that? And apparently, you know, based on the events of the last few days, YouTube is kind of drawing and their employees are drawing a a, a line in the sand. So furthermore, um, in January, YouTube announced that it's going to expand its efforts to reduce the spread of what it calls borderline content and harmful misinformation. And if you guys remember, this was kind of like the Adam Jones, Infowars, Alex Jones, sorry, and and the Infowars kind of things, borderline content and harmful misinformation. So this policy, which applies to videos that flirt with violating the community guidelines, but ultimately fall falls short, aims to limit the promotion of those videos through recommendations. YouTube said this, the policy, which affects videos, including flat earthers and peddlers of phony, phony miracle cures have already decreased the number of views that borderline videos receive by 50%. In the future, the company said it will recommend videos from more authoritative sources like top news channels in its next watch panel. So what makes a top news channel? Who defines what that is? And how does the algorithm decide if I'm watching a uh, liberal article, how does the feed decide what I see next. Is it going to give me a conservative point of view? Is it going to give me a more radical point of view to something I'm watching? How does that work? And Google's been very, uh, you, sorry, YouTube has been very, very vague in making these definitions. And folks, this is where the challenge gets even greater because for us, we rely on some of these algorithms to make our life easier. We look up one topic and then we're, we're, we're focused on that one topic and we're watching multiple videos from various sources. But if they're starting to replace these sources with a more authoritative sources, as they claim, like, and they give an example, top news channels, does that mean that I'm going to see more CNN or NBC and less Fox News or vice versa? And finally, YouTube said it would restrict channels from monetizing their videos if they are found to repeatedly brush up against our hate speech policies. And this goes now to the uh, Stephen Crowder, Carlos Mays kind of argument here. So Stephen Crowder has now been uh, demonetized off of YouTube's platform even though he's got 4 million subscribers, one of the largest conservative channels on YouTube. His hate speech is debatable at best. Um, Carlos Maza did put together a video of about a minute and a half of various times Steven Crowder uh, had addressed him, calling him queer or gay. But he wasn't really inciting uh, hate or harassing him. He was more degrading and talking about Carlos's Maza's point of view. And I'll, I'll get to more of that later in, in the podcast, um, especially uh, specifically on what Carlos, what Steven Crowder said about Carlos Maza, but then also how Carlos Maza identifies himself, which in itself is problematic. 
the channels that will be demonetized will not be able to run ads or use super chat, which lets channel subscribers pay creators directly for extra chat features. The last change um, has come after BuzzFeed reported that paid commentating system had been used to fund creators of videos featuring racism and hate speech. And there's a BuzzFeed story that came out uh, some time ago um, about how these features allow conspiracy theorists and hate speech and racism to continue to thrive on YouTube. And here's where the debate comes in between our uh, right for freedom of speech, the right for the freedom of press, and the regulation, and, and, and really how we view and how our regulators and our government views these organizations. So when you look at how YouTube defines itself, it's a platform. It's not a publisher because YouTube argues it doesn't create any content, therefore it's not a publisher. For example, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, Fox, those are publishers. They create their own content, so they are under a tighter set of rules and regulations, especially when it comes to censorship from the FCC. Being a platform, on the other hand, gives you you kind of fall in the wayland. And some of the recent debate on Congress and in the Hill has been, is Facebook, YouTube a utility or is it a platform? And if it's a utility, then how do the regulators regulate this specific utility? And these are questions that are our current challenge with these types of actions that are taken by some of these private companies. Now, they are private companies. And at the moment, they are entitled to make these decisions. The problem with that is when you have billions of users on your platform and you're making decisions to isolate one side over the other, you're limiting the amount of information that's on there and people rely on your platform for information. In some places, in some countries in the world, YouTube and Facebook are the only way people get any sort of information at all. And so if you're only representing one side of an argument because you're banning every other side because of borderline policies that may not serve the interest or you, you, you bend to pressure, then what happens next? And this is the challenge that some of these companies have. They get pressured to make a decision because someone gets really, really loud. And this is where these companies who really do have a very strong and stable platform ought to put their foot down and say, we are a platform for freedom of speech. And unless someone is blatantly saying lies, and this goes back to the flat earthers, which we know not to be true, the peddlers of phony miracle cures, the people who are blatantly racist and out there inciting violence against a specific group, whether it be Jews, Muslims, African Americans, or Hispanics. That's where that comes in. And, and I think that's where the definition is getting lost. And that's where we have a challenge with this. Simply stating, how is YouTube defining this? And th we had the same argument in previous episodes when we spoke about Facebook and um, we discussed Google and we discussed Amazon and other org other companies who our lives revolve around it. If you think of any device today, any browser, it accesses around five websites that are predominantly in various parts of the world in the top five. YouTube is typically in the top two no matter where you go around the globe. Facebook is in the top five no matter where you go around the world. Google is in the top three, no matter where you go around the world. Twitter's in the top 10. So these platforms are a mainstay of our daily lives, of how we access and get and share information. And having a complete and a very borderline policy that is not very definitive for the content creators is very troublesome because it creates a uh, a place where the content creators aren't really sure what they're doing. And I want to get to more of that here. So before we proceed, though, I want to invite you to join CyberHub Summit on September 11th, 2019 
in beautiful Atlanta. This invitation-only C-suite event is designed for a midday six-hour power event on cybersecurity featuring cybersecurity activities, roundtable discussions, and a very interactive panel and keynote address. So make sure you go to cyberhubsummit.com forward slash James, cyberhubsummit.com forward slash James to apply to attend for this event. So if you're a C-suite executive, whether you're a CISO, a CIO, a CTO, a CEO, a general counsel, and you wanna get a better idea on cybersecurity, and you wanna be in Atlanta that week of September, um, on September 11th, or if you're from the Atlanta or the Southeast region, I encourage you to go and apply. The event is really limited in space. It's going to be at a very unique location, which will be announced in the next few weeks. And I will talk about that, I believe, I hope by next week on this podcast, I will be hosting the event. So you'll get to see me there and we can get, interact. We'll be doing some live podcast recordings from this event as well. So you don't want to miss out if you're a, a C-suite executive working in fintech, industrial control systems, and utilities, in technology. You definitely want to be at this event. It's a one-of-a-kind type of event. It's not your standard event. It's really something uh, that will help you gain. You will leave with real one real takeaways. And number two, you will meet the right group of people there as well. So make sure, again, you go to cyberhubsummit.com forward slash James for more information on the event. So we get back to YouTube. And so one thing that YouTube did not do is it did not disclose the names of any channels that are expected to be affected by this change. And the company itself declined to really comment on the controversy right now between um, Carlos Maza and Steven Crowder. And the company originally did make some very good points. YouTube initially, when this whole uh, Carlos Maza, Steven Crowder kind of story has been raised, Facebook said that it was taking no action against Crowder, that his channel wasn't really being, it wasn't inciting violence or harassment. And it wasn't really judging his sexual orientation simply because Carlos's Maza's um, Twitter handle is Gay Maz. <laughs> so he identifies himself and he, he proudly promotes the fact that he is gay. And there is nothing wrong with that. But you also can't say that, that someone else who's calling you gay is harassing you when you identify your handle on Twitter is Gay Maz. That, that kind of is a, a, a hip hypocrisy at its best at that point. But this move by YouTube is really creating and triggering panic among a bunch of right-wing and conservative YouTube channels. And I love how the media will call them right-wing, as in to make them seem like they're extremists, but really it's more on the conservative side that they are banning. Because Steven Crowder has never once been called right-wing unless it's by the liberal mainstream media. For the most part, he's been called a conservative commentator. He just doesn't fit the mold of what the mainstream really considers to be mainstream media because he's a bit more conservative than some of his liberal colleagues. But you have liberal, and I want to say left-wing people on YouTube, for example, you know, Stephen Colbert or uh, what's his name, Trevor Noah, who actively incite violence and hate and Samantha B against the president or different people within the administration, yet their videos are gathering millions and millions of views on YouTube with no repercussion at all. So if Steven Crowder calling Carlos Mays over a period of a year, eight or nine times gay um, or a queer results in that being considered repeated harassment and incitement of uh, violence or harassment on the basis of his race and sexual orientation, then what does that mean for Stephen Colbert, who actively calls for violence and incites violence and harassment against the uh, Trump family and, and President Trump? Is it okay for him, but not okay for Stephen Crowder to do the same? When you make yourself a public figure, you subject yourself 
to people commentating and insulting you. That is part of being in the public eye. That comes with the territory. People will call you names. If every time someone calls you uh, gay or queer or, um, or an idiot and you consider that to be harassment, then maybe you shouldn't be in the public figure. I consider that you go work in the kitchen at McDonald's, Burger King, or in the back of a restaurant where the only person who will call you that will be your coworkers when you screw up an order. When people decide to go on an open social media platform and we start selling our privacy in that process, we really allow, we allow and open ourselves up to criticism and harassment where there has, the line has to be drawn is the incitement of violence against someone. And we saw that um, about a month ago when the FBI arrested someone who was online uh, inciting and threatening violence against uh, Jared Kushner, Donald Trump Jr., and uh, uh, the Daily Wire, uh, one of the Daily Wire uh, columnists and speakers, uh, Ben Shapiro. So that's where YouTube should be more active is people who are actively calling for other people to destroy and, and, and kill and steal. And there's a ton of that online. There's a ton of it online. And the Maza case has shown that YouTube doesn't always enforce its own rules. It's one thing to make a policy. It's another to ensure that a global workforce of underpaid contractors accurately understand and apply it. It'll be fascinating to see how the new policy, which prohibits videos alleging that a group is superior in order to justify segregation or exclusion, will affect discussions of immigration on YouTube. And that's going to be the real big test. Immigration is a very uh, hot item, and it probably will be leading up to the 2020 election, which will be kicking off in exactly 11 days. It's expected that on June 18th, President Trump will be announcing his uh, re-election bid for the, uh, for the highest office on in the land as the president of these United States of America in Orlando, Florida. And we've already seen the Democratic primary with, I think now there's 7,000 Democratic candidates for uh, vying for the spot of uh, what Joe Biden is now holding, but probably won't hold on for too long. This is going to be a very interesting election cycle to begin with. And we talk about it here because in America, politics have now become something that is very uh, divisive. And if you're not on one side, then you're on the other side. And if you're somewhere in the middle, you're nowhere. And that kind of, this is where 80% of the population sits. And this 80% of the population is about to suffer because of the other 20. The company says that political debates about pros and cons of immigration are still allowed. But a video saying that Muslims are diseased and shouldn't be allowed to migrate to Europe will be banned. And I agree with that. I think that's absolutely fair. Because Muslims are not diseased people. And if they want to migrate to Europe and Europe's willing to take him in, then by all means, that is not anyone else's business. That is Europe's internal business. There are some parts of Islamic ideology that don't conform to life in the West. But that's on every nation and every leadership of every nation to consider and different communities to consider. And I think one of the challenges we're going through right now and it's really highlighted by this specific scenario is we're polarizing every single topic and we're creating a level around it where people are focusing on all the wrong things. And what I mean by that is this whole YouTube Maza versus Crowder I, um, um, debate is distracting us from the real problem I have with this, which is what does this policy change mean for our privacy? And I want to address this in three questions. And we're going to talk about these. And I will say this right now. So if you're listening and you're at home, you're at work, um, you can go to Twitter. If you're not following us on Twitter, you can follow me, James underscore Azar1. Or you can go to our Cyberhub Engage Twitter 
and you can tweet at us uh, with the hashtag data cartels. And I want to have a debate and a conversation about this. I do. I don't know that I have all the answers and I'm always willing and open to hear the other side. That's what I do on my other podcast. We debate cybersecurity with cybersecurity practitioners. We don't always have to agree, but we sure as hell debate. And we're still friends. And they still want to come back on the show. And the same goes on here. While I talk to you and highlight different privacy violations and privacy concerns that I have, that we all should have, Here's where the issues with this new YouTube policy and the vague social media policies around censorship exist. The rules are so vague and it leaves it to a group of people to make this decision. I'm a big Joe Rogan fan, huge Joe Rogan fan. And when he had, when he had Jack Dorsey on the first time and they had to bring him on again, I was glad he brought him on a second time and I was glad he really dug in there a second time and really asked him some of these questions. And Jack Dorsey couldn't give any good answers to very good questions that were asked by Joe Rogan. And I say that because Joe Rogan asked, how do you dictate what's an offensive tweet and what's not an offensive tweet? How do you kick one person off your platform and leave another? And I'm going to bring this up here and, and here's the debate I have. So we talk about freedom of religion and discrimination against religion. But I'm going to go directly into that very sensitive topic because here's where I am wanting to challenge my left wing and liberal friends. And if you're listening and watching, I want you to consider this and I want you to tweet at me with the hashtag data cartels and we can have a debate on this on Twitter in front of the whole world. <laughs> Or you can do it privately. But I prefer we do it on Twitter because I want to see other opinions. So here's my debate. If an uh, Islamic imam is posting on his YouTube channel for his congregation and he's calling the Western, uh, he's calling to death to America, death to Israel, death to England. He's saying that Jews are pigs and apes and he's saying that Christians should be paying a 50% tax to live in Islamic countries. And that raping a non-Muslim is quite okay. And that enslaving non-Muslims is completely acceptable. And this is the kind of speech that's inciting hatred, racism, and violence against specific groups. But that's still allowed on YouTube because it's religious. If a Catholic priest came on YouTube, and here's the other side of this, and was giving a lecture on how he molests kids in a, at church or part of his congregation. Would that be acceptable? No, it's pedophilia. People would be outraged. If a Catholic priest came out and said, we should kick all immigrants, and, and, and it doesn't have to be Catholic. I'm sorry I'm picking on Catholics, but I'm just saying. Came out and said, no Muslim should live in a Christian nation. Would YouTube still allow that priest or pastor or leader of a religious group to keep that video online? And that's a question we should be asking ourselves because YouTube, Facebook, and others are making these decisions arbitrarily. Meaning the rules are vague and the freedoms that they wish to protect are mostly going to protect an alleged minority. And I say alleged minority because we look at uh, Muslims in the U.S. and we consider them a minority, but then Muslims across Asia and the Middle East are a majority. So what does that make? So does that mean that that hate speech should be allowed in those Islamic majority countries, but shouldn't be allowed somewhere else? And does that only apply to the United States or is it a community policy across all of YouTube globally? And does YouTube not ban that kind of hate that comes from imams because it's afraid that these Islamic countries might block YouTube from that country? So for the sake of money, they're letting that run 
but then they're banning and they're demonetizing Steven Crowder for making fun of Carlos Mace. Uh, I mean, that's a question. And it's vague. And I'm concerned because what happens when YouTube hears this very podcast and hears me challenging them and decides to ban me from YouTube? What does that mean for me as a content creator? What does it mean for the privacy of all of us? And that gets me to my next real concern here is who in YouTube decides what I see, how I see, and what videos should be suggested next? How does that decision get made? Here's my concern, folks. 30, 40 years ago, the newspapers reported the news, didn't give opinions on the news. Today, you can't find anyone that reports the news. There's very few channels that really report the news. If you follow me on Twitter or Instagram, I posted uh, just last week a research a graph of where different news organizations sit on a scale from extremely right wing to extremely left wing and mis complete and absolute misinformation to, you know, reporting the news with a slight opinion to one side or the other of the political spectrum. So we know we don't have a, a very centrist source that's reporting the news because there's no money in it. For the most part, there's no money in it because people want to feel vindicated. We want our opinion on a specific topic vindicated. So we listen to people who vindicate our opinion. And if that's the average user behavior online, then the incitement of hate, violence, and racism could be applied even to the most center left or center right person who might be inciting that Illegal immigration is really bad and people should be, you know, stopping immigrants at any price. And, that, you know, if, if someone who listens to that person who's a slightly right wing or a slightly left wing, left leaning individual or right leaning individual and does violence, do you ban that person? No different than how BuzzFeed said that the person who went and drew a swastika at a synagogue was influenced by the ultra conservative Ben Shapiro. The man who is the ultra of orthodox in the Jewish community is inciting people to put swastikas at synagogues. That was a BuzzFeed report. And they never even redacted that report. They made some slight changes, but they never even apologized because that headline took through. And this is the challenge we have now. Every single news media, mainstream media outlet out there has classified this move by YouTube as banning Nazis and white supremacy from their platform. But what about Antifa? What about radical preachers who are inciting violence and people who listen to it go out and carry attacks? It's not just ISIS folks. It's not just Al-Qaeda. Those are not the only terror organizations out there. Fact is, when you speak to people who are in homeland security and anti-terror, they talk about the radicalization done through local mosques. So why aren't we addressing that? And if YouTube's going to hold Steven Crowder and demonetize him, then demonetize other people and kick him off your platform as well. And this is where we get into our privacy. Who's monitoring this movement by YouTube? And how can we as consumers really protect our privacy in a move just like this one? When I say goodbye privacy, when I say data cartels, this is exactly what I talk about. It's these unilateral moves done by these private organizations who are led by people who don't make decisions based on the general consensus of being fair, they make decisions based on their personal beliefs. Like, I don't think that this is the right thing for us to be and have on our platform. And employers give employees so much ownership that employees become almost God in this matter. They are becoming online gods. These review committees in YouTube, at Facebook, in Twitter, are essentially deciding who makes money and who doesn't. They are becoming an employment 
verification firm. They're deciding who can monetize off their platform, who can advertise on their platform and what they say and do on their platform. So we're heading into a 2020 election cycle that is bound to be nasty based on everything that's happened since the Obama, the, the midterms, the second midterm of the Obama administration to what, 2014? Until today, five years in, every election has been nasty. And it's been like this since the Clinton administration, but we won't go that far back. Some of our listeners don't even know who Bill Clinton is, and others know just Hillary. But the Clinton political machine changed a lot about how elections were done. There are classy moves in elections and there are not classy moves in elections. And this election is bound to be very, very, very contentious. And there will be opinions and policies and misinformation that's going to be spread that will affect the way people vote. My concern with this move from YouTube is how informed will we be coming up to the 2020 election? And is this how the media plans on really tipping the scales? Because most of us go to the free platform to get our information. Very few people support paid platforms. That's why we ask our subscribers to go to Patreon and support us on Patreon. So that if our advertisers stop their sponsorship dollars, and we don't have a lot of them. We're not like the Daily Wire or Joe Rogan or others who have a slew of advertisers. We don't have many. So I'm not really concerned for me. I'm concerned for the other voices out there. The other voices out there that are trying to balance the cycle and are unable to do so. And are we compromising and limiting the amount of knowledge and information that's being put out there given this move. If YouTube can ban and demonetize anyone off their platform based on a vague set of rules, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for the information we get? And finally, how should YouTube, Facebook, and others be viewed as platforms or publishers? And those rules are very different and the enforcements are very different as well. When you look at how These platforms are viewed at the moment. They're viewed as platforms, meaning we're just a tool. We're just a conduit between a content creator to a content receiver, to a user. But are they really just that? Or are they so much more? And that's a question we should be asking ourselves. And we should be asking our regulators. We should be calling our local congressman and senator and talking to them about this very issue. There's going to need to be some sort of consensus in how we regulate these social media platforms. And my guess is nothing's going to happen before the 2020 election, mainly because the Democrats won't be inclined because this kind of media sources, Facebook and YouTube, tend to lean more left and support a Democratic agenda than they do right. So Congress would have no incentive whatsoever to really make a move on something like this, unless it turns around and bites them in the tail in the 2020 election, then I think we'll start to see that be the case come 2021, if they have any say in it at all. But if they're viewed as publishers, then they should be held. And this is where we really need to go and look back at our constitution and understand that there needs to be an amendment to address social media. A greater amendment, a greater definition of what it is. What does so freedom of speech and freedom of the press mean in the world of social media? And that comes from one, defining the social media platforms. Number two, redefining what freedom of speech and freedom of press really mean. And when it comes to our privacy, all of this means that our information is being out there being used and content is being curated to specifically address one point of view or another. So I did a test. Um, last night, folks, I cleared all my devices, used a VPN, went in and went on YouTube and started watching a ton of videos. And I started watching videos that first were very left-leaning and uh, liberal-leaning videos. And as I kept watching, they became more and more extreme, meaning the suggest suggested video to watch next was an even more indoctrined video of the first one I saw. 
and it was literally watching propaganda being spewed at me in that moment. Hell, for a second, I thought I was going to vote Democrat again. <laughs> but that was a case right then and there of content being curated based on something and becoming more extreme as I viewed it more and more and more, whether it be conspiracy theories around. And, and one of the videos I watched yesterday was the, 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 the theory around the flat earth. It was funny. I said, is the earth really flat? And in my first few videos I watched, someone was completely debunking the theory, which I agree with. And another person made it sound really, really convincing. Like the world's a big circle. It's not really a, uh, we're just a big circle and we rotate. And everything rotates around us. We don't rotate at all and so forth. And, and then that, you know, that the whole theory, and it didn't make sense based on the science we have, but that was a video that I think had over five or six million views on YouTube. So I'm curious now, based on the new YouTube policy, if that video will no longer be there. And I'll report on that next week. So I've posed these three questions for you. These three challenges that exist with this new YouTube policy and how we need to go about it. And like I said before I started this, I welcome your feedback. I want to have a very open debate on this very topic. Should we? Or should we not be concerned with this move on YouTube? And if so, why? And if not, why not? What's the argument around this? Our, how much more of our privacy can be redeemed? And how many of you are really willing to pay to maybe use social media? Are you willing to pay a subscription fee to have unfiltered content and access to YouTube, meaning no tra no, tra no tracking you, no ads, no nothing, just unfiltered access, no algorithms, no nothing. And how much would you be willing to pay for that if that was the case? Same with Facebook, same with Twitter. Love to hear your opinions on this. So again, you can go to our uh, CyberHub Engage Twitter page, or you can go to my Twitter page, James underscore Azar1. That's Alpha Zulu, Alpha Romeo, and the number one. And you can tweet at me with the hashtag data cartels, and we can have this debate. That's it for today's episode. Next time on Goodbye Privacy, we will really get to the credit bureaus, the real data cartels. And we'll talk about them in depth next week here on the goodbye privacy podcast so make sure you support us on patreon by going to patreon.com forward slash cyber hub engage and that you're subscribing to our youtube channel at cyber hub engage and following us on twitter facebook linkedin join our groups be part of the discussion and we have a group on facebook that's called what global privacy advocates and on LinkedIn. So uh, you can join our Global Privacy Advocates, Advocates group on LinkedIn and Facebook where we will take this discussion even more in depth. That's it for this week. We'll talk to you guys and be with you again next week.